At the beginning of March 2023, Georgians took to the streets. They were protesting against the proposed bills on foreign agents. There is a similar law in force in Russia. It was implemented in order to weaken civil society. Georgia seemed to be the pro-European leader in the region. So why is it having to deal with similar challenges? We decided to fly to Georgia so we could understand this issue better. When we made it to Tbilisi at the end of March, there was no trace of the protests. In the city center on Rustaveli Avenue, it was perfectly calm. The only reminders of the recent unrest were the barricades in front of parliament and some hard to remove spray paint on its walls. The draft bills on foreign agents have been scrapped. The Georgian government was stopped. Georgian dream, which, uh, which actually ruling party at the moment they control anything and everything in there. They control parliament, they control government, courts, any institutions. I think they, not, they are not fully controlling maybe president and maybe ombudsman. We spoke to Valery Chachalashvili. He's a politician and a diplomat, the former Georgian ambassador to Ukraine, Switzerland and Russia. During the Saakashvili presidency, he was Minister of Finance for a short time and he twice served as a Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. It was a good decision, uh, may I say. Uh, and it is good that it was not only good, but fast decision to withdraw this law. This was good. What was not good is that um, uh, the rhetorics which uh, uh, is applied by ruling party, they are not saying that it was wrong law and that it was a mistake. The, the rhetoric is that, uh, that they, are, they did not explain properly to the people what kind of law was that, which is a weak position because uh, everybody knows very well. You know, when all your friends are telling you that it is wrong, that it is not European and so on, and when only in Russia people are crazy happy about, about Georgia you know, working on that law, you have, to, you have to make your own conclusions. And it's so crystal clear now, it's so black and white, that I don't think that anybody in the ruling party will be, will be able to explain anything like that to the, to the society, and particularly to youngsters. Yeah, because we all know what happened in, in Russia after they adopted the first law on foreign agents in, in 2012. The rhetoric was exactly the same, that this is nothing, this is about transparency only, and there will be no pressure provided. Valery Chachalashvili also spoke about the huge role which young people played in the recent protests. These young people stand out in Georgian society. The difference between them uh, and the uh, other part of the society is that, that they are completely free, number one, that this is a generation which due to the reforms which were um, uh, provided by Saakashvili government, they had an opportunity to enter the most prestigious universities without bribes. Uh, they got an opportunity to know better what is Europe, because uh, we have a uh, visa-free regime with the European Union. We have um, uh, low-cost uh, uh, available flights. So, uh, the overwhelming majority of th those youngsters, they already know, mm, know Europe not only theoretically, but in practice. And uh, they see clearly their future in Europe. The new generation, young people born into an independent Georgia, see the experiences of the generations who spent part of their lives in the Soviet Union as something abstract. I mean the lack of freedom, any form of limits on their freedom. But it's not only that. For young people, it's absolutely unacceptable. And this is the point. It's the red line that they refuse to be pushed behind. 
Not far from the bathhouses in the heart of Tbilisi's historic quarter, we talked to Magdalena Novakowska, a Polish woman who's lived in Georgia for over 20 years. She's an expert on Georgia and a translator of the Georgian language. She told us about her initial experiences in the country in the 1990s, a time that young Georgians don't remember. If we're talking about the Georgia I first encountered, at that time it was a failed state. It was a mess. Almost no systems were functioning. There was ubiquitous corruption. In principle, there were no benefits of civilization. It's the stuff of legend that there was no electricity or gas, and the gas and electricity were only available selectively, and that was how their economy functioned. We can complete this story in Guria in western Georgia, where we visited Dato Tanyashvili's plantation. And these constantly fall. Tea leaves are permanently green. The leaves fall on the ground and dry out. In the 1990s, Tenyashvili was deputy minister for economic development. After leaving office, he returned to his home region of Guria, which had been famous for its tea in Soviet times. But the new era has not been kind to the region. Dishonest investors took specialist equipment to other countries, and residents of Guria turned the plantation's fields over to the production of food for their families. Tenyashvili had to start from scratch. He sought inspiration in Chinese books on growing tea. He also had to deal with technical challenges. He designed and built his own machines. And since the power supply was rare and came on at unexpected times, he built his own hydroelectric plant. First one, and then another. He set an example for his neighbors, and tea production is slowly re-emerging in Guria, though there is a long way to go before it returns to the industrial scale of the previous era. Dato Tenyashvili's difficult situation is reminiscent of the difficult period which Georgia went through after regaining independence. The change was started by the Rose Revolution in 2003, which ended Eduard Shevardnadze's rule. The group connected to the soon-to-be president Saakashvili took power. It started the most important reforms for the country and the positive effects of those reforms are still felt. Systems which were planned and implemented back then are in principle responsible for the country still functioning because it was a comprehensive reform of the administration which needed to be carried out practically from scratch. And in a lot of areas, education, infrastructure, very many important and necessary reforms. It's true that Georgia then turned to the West once and for all. Talking about the direction of foreign policy though, no one has the slightest doubt that what happened in Georgia domestically is a subject for a different discussion. Because especially near the end of the Saakashvili government, there were very many justified accusations about human rights breaches, about limits on the freedom of the press, of persecuting the opposition, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, we absolutely need to say that the direction of foreign policy was clear, and it was towards the West. Saakashvili's importance can't be overstated. He was the one who set up modern Georgia. He's the positive and negative point of reference for everything that's happening now. He was the voice of the street, a revolutionary, the face of Georgia's democratic change, the organizer of the country's modernization, or in fact, creating it anew because that country was not functioning in the 1990s, the person who showed Georgia to the world. He generated a certain enthusiasm about Georgia. It's worth remembering that due to the Rose Revolution and Saakashvili, and the fact that his reforms were so effective and spectacular, the European Union expanded the European neighborhood policy to countries in Eastern Europe, which led to the Eastern Partnership. In a sense, Ukraine is on its path because Georgia opened institutional pathways. It provided hope that a former Soviet country can be so profoundly reformed. On the other hand, he's a very controversial figure. He has been accused, sometimes fairly, of megalomania, of arrogance in his leadership, which at a certain point demonstrated an authoritarian turn of the Georgian state. Georgian society reacted to this very decisively in the 2011-2012 elections by removing Saakashvili from power.
Saakashvili's time in office was a period of confrontation with Russia, in particular the 2008 war. The shadow of this still hangs over Georgian politics. I remember my, my days uh, back in 1995 when I was ex in Oxford and we had a guest, uh, the, um, the defense uh, minister secretary of the United Kingdom, and he was giving the speech about the former Soviet countries. And uh, when he touched Georgia, he imagined that Georgia, uh, by that time and still, you know, is the prison of geography. And it, it has ingrained in my memories, you know, and of course, you know, that uh, this connotation explains a lot of things. Victor Kipiani runs the Geocase think tank. He is the co-founder of the MKD Law Office. He was the legal representative of the richest Georgian, Bidzina Ivanishvili. Uh, regardless, of, of, regardless of the tough neighborhood, we have our civilizational choice. And of course, the fact that we are surrounded by tough neighbors does not diminish in any, uh, to any extent, you know, in terms of pursuing that civilizational choice. And that civilizational choice about Georgia one day uh, becoming part of the political Europe. We deem ourselves to be the member of the cultural Europe, but, you know, one, well, it's, it's, it's a different thing to become a fully fledged member of, of the political uh, Europe. And definitely we have to pursue that, that course without, without any hesitations. But it's also about the geography. And when we speak about the geography, we definitely have to take into account uh, a number of a myriad of geopolitical risks and challenges. In 2008, over the course of a few days, Russia took over the city of Gori and shelled the port in Poti. In doing so, they blocked the main transport route between the capital and the coast. We wanted to understand that this route is the only realistic option, so we decided to see the road which drivers would be forced to take when the road through central Georgia was unavailable. According to Satnav, the route from Batumi to Ataltsikha is just over 160 kilometers long, but should take us around five hours to drive. It soon becomes clear why. A large section is along unsurfaced roads. The road is covered in mud and massive puddles. It's also steep. As we approach the Goderdzi Pass, 2,000 meters above sea level, we also have to deal with snow. It's the end of March and there are over two meter high snow drifts in the pass itself. Officially, the pass is closed and only a few vehicles are let through. In the end, it took us over eight hours to reach Akhaltsikha. One thing is certain, this road is not an alternative. Geography is also a factor in how Georgia sees Russia. Of course, you know, I cannot uh, myself envisage uh, any normal dialogue with Russia without uh, Russians pulling out their troops from Georgia, but when I'm saying in a normal dialogue, that does not mean that we should turn our back to any slightest opportunity of starting a dialogue, uh, gorging, exploring, and examining if there are any prospects of reaching consensus. Of course, these times it became much, much harder with Russian aggression in Ukraine. And uh, in that context, when we speak about Georgia security, it's not uh, in as much about Georgia security, but it's about the fate of the region. And when we say that nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, it also means that nothing about Georgia without Georgia. And it also means that when we speak and when we discuss the war in Ukraine, it's not just about the war in Ukraine. It's, it is much, much big stake uh, on the agenda. Support for Ukraine and its defense can be seen wherever you go in Tbilisi. The ties connecting Georgia and Ukraine are exceptional. Ukraine always supported us. Now, with the providing in the, in the 90s when we actually were facing, we were facing hunger, they were providing wheat, they were providing military support to us in building up of our military forces, both border defense and army. You know, they played a very important role in saving our refugees in 1992 when a dramatic, uh, you know, developments were faced in Abkhazia. And I can name a lot of other things also. 
And I, I'm always saying that we have to support Ukraine not only because Ukraine is right, not only because we love Ukraine, not only because Ukraine deserves from Georgia the overwhelming support and help because it's our friend, but, but because it's also in our national interests. Because national interests of Georgia and Ukraine are 100% coinciding. This is Euro integration, this is Euro Atlantic integration, and this is fighting with our common enemy, with the Russian Federation. So, supporting Ukraine, actually, we are supporting ourselves. And overwhelmingly, uh, uh, I think the population of Georgia understand that quite well. But statements of support for Ukraine are also a symbolic opposition to Russian immigrants who are in Georgia, for example, to hide from general mobilization. I think it also shows, uh, it, it, or it was displayed in the attitude towards this new Russian immigration. In 2008, the philosopher and political scientist Professor Gianodia spent several months as the Minister of Education and Science in Georgia. You know, basically, even in Soviet Union, Georgians were never anti-Russian culturally. So there were people who were for independence and against Kremlin, but Russians were okay Russians, and we were friendly to Russians. And uh, uh, that also changed, basically. And this changed now. Even 2008 war didn't change it that much, but it changed now because probably that the migration was really massive and the people are not aggressive and they don't attack Russians, of course, but there is, uh, uh, people make sure that uh, you don't expect us to be friends, at least if you are kind of for Putin and you are, or if you are not expressly against Putin. Georgian-Russian relations are particularly complex. Georgia came under Russian influence at the end of the 18th century. The two countries had a lot in common. Above all, they both share Orthodox Christianity, which is the major religion for both Georgians and Russians. Georgians were predominantly surrounded by Muslims. The Armenians are the exception. They have their own Gregorian Christian church. On the one hand, we have Azerbaijan, and on the other, we have Iranians and Turks. So it's a Muslim neighborhood which is quite foreign in religious and cultural terms and fairly hostile. And finally, in the 18th century, the Georgian kings decided to move closer to Russia so that Russia could protect Georgia from the Muslim invaders. After some time, it turned out that Georgia became a part of the Russian Empire. Not only as a protectorate, it was annexed. First Eastern Georgia, then Western Georgia. It took a few decades, but around the middle of the 19th century, the entirety of Georgia was controlled by Russia. Modern-day Ajara came a little later at the end of the 1870s. And Georgian-Russian relations are not uniform. Because in Poland, we see the partitions in an entirely negative light, the partition of Poland, the Russian area and the others. Here the balance isn't clearly negative. You can see this, for example, in Georgian school textbooks the new ones, not Soviet ones. And these textbooks describe, on the one hand, the colonization of Georgia, of conquest, about the colonial policy which the Tsarist regime applied towards Georgia, about the exploitation of Georgia. On the other hand, though, the same textbooks write about the unification of the Georgian lands. The paradox is based on the fact that Russia was a colonizer and occupier but it also unified the Georgian lands which had been dispersed for centuries. Being part of Russia made it possible for Georgia, because of Russia and the Russian language and culture, to return to Europe, to reinstate its contacts with Europe, which had in the early Middle Ages been more intense, but subsequently halted when the Turks took Anatolia and cut off the route to the Middle East and Greece for Georgians. Thanks to Russia, this route was open. In comparison to the Tsarist times in Georgia, the communist period is viewed almost completely negatively. In Tbilisi, there's a museum of the Russian occupation, and it has the numbers 21, 
and 91 in its name. In 1921, the Democratic Republic of Georgia ceased to exist, the three-year statehood known as the First Independence. In 1991, it regained independence. And the only exception here, a scratch on this completely negative image in the view of Georgians about the Soviet period is the state, I stress the word state, Museum of Stalin in Gori, which is still open and offering various souvenirs with the Generalissimo. Whether we like it or not, he's obviously the most famous Georgian worldwide. The bullet holes on Rustaveli Avenue pay testament to the unusual attitude to Stalin which Georgians have. In 1956, there were fervent protests on the streets of the capital in defense of Stalin's reputation, just after his crimes had been made public. However, for the past 10 to 20 years, Georgians have become increasingly critical of the Soviet leader, and his statue, which for years adorned the center of Gori, was removed in 2010 and abandoned in a field. Georgia is a difficult case. On the one hand, it's a clearly anti-Russian country and clearly pro-Western. That's been visible since the fall of the USSR when Georgia was at the absolute forefront of those countries which wanted to break away from Russia, which most quickly formulated their ambitions to move to the West. There was the Rose Revolution, Saakashvili's reforms. We can see it in the streets of Georgia, this Westernness, the English language which young people speak much more than Russian. And today we see Ukrainian flags, a declared support for Ukraine and the identification with the West. The protests which took place recently, clearly against the country's pivot. All of this is Georgia, the real Georgia. And we see it, and for us it's comprehensible. But at the back of our minds we need to be aware that this is a very conscious and active part of Georgian society. And behind them there is a relatively narrow group of people who have a more pro-Russian, or clearly conservative and pro-Russian mindset. Sometimes it has a bit of Soviet nostalgia to it. And somewhere between those two extreme groups is the majority of society which is mistrustful, above all to their own political class. It's surprising that around 40% of Georgians don't trust their political environment. They don't have a party they'd like to support. This part of society is fearful of the consequences of the war in Ukraine and views it through the prism of the confrontation between the West and Russia. And they feel that Georgia is too small to risk entering the conflict or that Georgia could be instrumentalized. Professor Nodia insists that this narrative is being used by the ruling Georgian Dream Party to discourage citizens from actively supporting Ukraine and to justify their policies. Uh, people are uh, scared of that. Of course, when they see what's happening in Ukraine, okay, you know, people are people. People don't want something like that happening in Georgia. And uh, uh, many conspiracy theories that... Uh, Georgian Dream uses that the West uh, involved in some kind of great conspiracy to drag Georgia into the war. They're totally absurd, of course, but the message behind it that we are the force which keeps uh, Georgia out of open conflict with Russia, uh, that works to some extent. <laughs> It's important to remember that a significant proportion of Georgians have not clearly called for pro-Western action. There are surveys which are credible because 70 to 80 percent of Georgians consistently state they are in favor of integration with the EU and NATO. However, the majority of Georgians do not want Georgia to be active in any war with Russia, for Georgia to undertake any openly anti-Russian actions or risks of this kind. One thing which is very strong among Georgians is a feeling of fatigue with the West. Mikhail Saakashvili was a person who caused this kind of fatigue. It was like ADHD. Everything happened so quickly, so intensively. Not everyone could keep up. At a certain moment, the visible privileges and benefits of integration with the West stopped coming to Georgia. Because, of course, when they received visa-free movement, what's left to strive for when their integration prospects are constantly being delayed? And all this interacts with the feeling that 
we should wait. We're a country with an ancient culture, with an ancient political culture, with our own values which we hold dear. It's a very widespread issue in Georgia that people associate European politics with the promotion of minority rights, including sexual minority rights. People here are clearly pro-Western and they'll insist yes to the West, yes to the EU, but those things aren't so important. It's not necessary. It's too much. The situation is much more complicated than it appears at first glance. Firstly, the Georgian society, especially Generation Z and the Millennials, are in favor of the EU. This is visible in all the surveys and declarations. We need to ask, however, whether this genuinely goes beyond declarations. Many people declare the will to integrate with the European Union up until a point that they are faced with obligations. So we'll gladly take the EU funds coming to us. But when it comes to discussing gender balance, Georgians are much more cautious, I'd even say conservative. The basis of these conservative views held by some Georgians is the Georgian Orthodox Church. The Georgian Orthodox Church isn't only the largest religious association in Georgia, it's much, much more. It's part of one's national identity. For many Georgians, being Georgian means being Orthodox, being a member of the Georgian Orthodox Church. Georgia, for most of its history, was partitioned and there were multiple statelets, and the things which connected them were, of course, the Georgian language, the King of Georgia, whose rule in some places didn't extend far beyond his own royal palace, and the Georgian Orthodox Church. Catholicos Patriarch of all Georgia was the spiritual leader of the nation, someone who symbolized this Georgian statehood which didn't exist in the form of a single unified kingdom, as had been the case in the Middle Ages. However, at present, the strength and position of the Georgian Orthodox Church is linked to Patriarch Ilya II. He's quite a venerable person and a venerable hierarch. He recently turned 90 years old. He's led the church for several decades. He's made a position for himself which is incomparable to any other public figure in Georgia. We wanted to talk to the Georgian Patriarch, but it turned out to be impossible. We had arranged to meet his secretary for an interview, but at the last moment, we learned that he had not received consent for the conversation. Instead of that, we spoke to a man whose posters on the streets of Tbilisi call him the enemy of the church, Professor Nodia. He told us about the dangers connected to the fact that the church is close to the ruling Georgian Dream Party. Government does not have many cards to play in its ideological game, so it has this very crude theory that these pro-Western liberals are undermining Georgian cultural authenticity, which is linked to Orthodox religion. And I am on that poster, I am presented in this group of people who is fighting the church of fighting Georgian Orthodox religion and um, okay uh, that works with some people yes but uh, uh, I think we see that uh, this message uh, uh, is not uh, sufficient it's, uh, I mean government uh, relies a lot on its linkage with the church and support of the church but ultimately it also undermines authority of the church because the church gained its authority as kind of neutral player above politics, but if the church is seen as a supporter of government which is increasingly unpopular, it's also bad for the church. So I guess this game, they are continuing to play that because they don't have any other game to play, but I don't think that's too, too effective. A further problem for the Georgian Orthodox Church is its relations with the Russian Orthodox Church, especially in recent months. Uh, still, Georgian Orthodox Church has a strong influence, uh, but uh, uh, the stronger emotional, uh, emotional platform of Georgians is that, uh, in that uh, Russia is an uh, occupying state. Uh, and it's not only that Russia in past occupied 20% of Georgian territories, but uh, it continues. It's creeping occupation every day. They are uh, kidnapping people, uh, you know, uh, on the administrative border. 
they are they are killing uh, our citizens i mean and it's very painful we understood how close the problems associated with the continuing russian threat are while driving towards south ossetia the georgian police stop us a few kilometers from the border they warn us that there could already be russians just one kilometer from this final sentry point they order us to turn back this is why the outcome of the war in Ukraine can be of great significance for the future of Georgia. This situation is wildly dynamic. Of course, the most important contest in the region is on the front lines in Ukraine. And everyone is completely aware that this will also have consequences for Georgia. In fact, it's worth asking the question, what will Russia be like? We can't discuss it in the category of power, of course. This is a nation of three and a half million people on a territory of around two Polish regions. So we shouldn't talk about any military action. What will happen in Ukraine will dramatically influence the whole global world, including, of course, South Caucasus. I think that uh, uh, Russian defeat is inevitable in this, uh, in this war. Uh, I think that uh, what Russia will face uh, is uh, what uh, President Joe Biden said even in March 2022. He said that Russia will face in Ukraine strategic defeat. For me, strategic defeat of Russia means two things, first of all. First, depriving Russia of uh, capacity to blackmail the whole world with nuclear weapons and uh, um, uh, energy, energy blackmailing and uh, so on. And uh, second, depriving Russia of the uh, capacity to annex or um, occupy territories of the neighboring state. If uh, Russia will be seen as victorious in this war, in the end of the day, that will strengthen this pro-Russian position of the government that, you know, okay, we were wise, we sided with the winner, basically, and small countries should side with the winner. And the West is no good, it cannot really protect us, as it failed to protect Ukraine. So that's basically the narrative that the government is pursuing. But if uh, the outcome of the war shows that Russia failed and the West did really help Ukraine, then I think uh, uh, this uh, government uh, will, have, uh, will not have anything uh, to stand on basically, because its narrative will be fully defeated. Of course, a large proportion of Georgian citizens want to move towards the West, to cooperate with the West, and they want integration into Western structures, like the European Union, NATO, or other Western organizations and transatlantic structures. But there is a large proportion of citizens who don't want to move towards the West. This is the conservative part of citizens who think like this. The West is very far away, and when Georgia has problems, the West can't help. This was the case in 2008. Of course, when five presidents came to Georgia, it was a very beautiful act in PR and psychological terms. But the reality was completely different. Many Georgian citizens are considering normalizing relations with Russia. And the proportion of those who want to move towards the West or towards Russia is permanently changing. Georgia today is in a very important moment and a very important place. We naturally see the war in Ukraine. That is the main front line of, let's say, the struggle between the West and Russia, between two civilizational orders, which is being waged in military terms. But the same thing is happening here, without the military factor, more quietly. But the tension is here. The same choice is also very intensively being made. The street protests, which we saw at the beginning of March, are one of the signs of this. And in the coming months or years, the decision will be made in Georgia. 
The silent war will lean one way or the other. Georgia will either hold out and will be able to capitalize on the effort it made in the last 20 to 30 years, or it will lose that energy and momentum, and it will lose this war. On May 19th, after a four-year hiatus, air services between Georgia and Russia were resumed. This is another pro-Russian gesture by the Georgian authorities in recent months. However, the government in Tbilisi continues to point to integration with the Euro-Atlantic structures as its primary goal.